Jetzt sind wir hier und haben vor allen Dingen Shinnet Boucher in der Leitung aus Auckland, aus Neuseeland. Wir haben es eben schon angesprochen. Ähm, ihr Unternehmen, sie ist CEO vom Stuff Magazine, einem großen, dem größten Medienhaus in Neuseeland. Und die haben einfach entschieden, dass sie sagen, sie machen bei Facebook nicht mehr mit. Das heißt, die Inhalte von Stuff werden nicht mehr bei Facebook verteilt. Sie haben sich dafür, zu diesem Schritt äh, im vergangenen Jahr entschieden, im letzten Sommer. Und dem ging voraus äh, die Attentate in Christchurch ähm, und äh, die mediale Verbreitung äh, dieses Attentats bei Facebook, woraufhin sich das Unternehmen schon entschied, nicht mehr mit Facebook Facebook zu werben oder bei Facebook zu werben und nun freuen wir uns sehr, dass Shinnet Boucher bei uns ist und sie hat viel zu berichten, denn ihr Unternehmen hat 400 Journalisten und ist damit das größte Unternehmen, Medienunternehmen in Neuseeland und 2017 kaufte Shinnet ihr Unternehmen für nur einen Dollar. Wie das gehen konnte, wird sie uns gleich erzählen und hier ist sie bei uns. A warm welcome. Hello Shinnet. Good to have you with us. Uh. Kia ora, from New Zealand. Guten Tag. <laughs> Sehr gut, vielen Dank. Um, and you're with us from Auckland, right? Right now? No, uh, I live in Wellington. Ah, in New that's Zealand. nice as well. And it's uh, yeah. in the evening right now, I think. It's 9 p.m. It or something? Yes. 10 p.m. It's a, yeah. al almost 10 p.m. Okay. Yeah. So we make it quick so you can uh, have a nice evening. So uh, we start. Um, I read a lot about you and I read about you that you are bold, brave and positive. So what was your bravest move? Buying this media company or taking a fight with Facebook? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know that I would say buying the media company was a brave move because the alternative to buying stuff and which was the biggest digital brand in New Zealand and, um, and our 50 newspapers and magazines um, would be that they would likely have been closed down by our foreign owner. Um, and so it didn't seem a brave step to do. It seemed a necessary step to do a year ago. It was a year ago when we were in the first lockdown for COVID. Um, and I think as a result of buying stuff, it gave us the chance to uh, reset and imagine what we wanted to mean to New Zealanders as a New Zealander-owned business. And um, we were, that led us to prioritise growth and public trust as our key metric of success, which is what led us to re-examine um, our relationship with Facebook and decide that we were going to step back from that. From that. So could you explain the German audience, why could you buy a media company for just one dollar? Yeah, uh, it was a unique combination of circumstances. Um, our company, our, our parent, our Australian parent company had been bought by another company and they didn't want to own a business in New Zealand. So they had already signaled they wanted to sell us. And um, when COVID came along and New Zealand went into lockdown, I think they got worried that, you know, everybody was closing down, all the businesses were closing up for a couple of months. They got worried that our business might have um, needed cash or needed to be uh, financially supported. So they um, indicated that they were likely to just wind the business up. Um, and as an alternative to that, I offered them a dollar. Um, to take it on for ourselves in New Zealand and, and run it, um, for, you know, with the staff. And they were very happy to do that. And it's turned out to be the, the best decision that we, we could possibly have made a, a year later. We feel stronger, healthier and thriving and we are still here. <laughs> That's a very great story and that's very hopeful. So um, we are talking at this conference a lot about Google and Facebook and the power they have and how we are kind of depending with our reach and our readership um, on these platforms. So it's very interesting to hear about the, the move you did last year. You left Facebook and Instagram. So could you tell us more about your decision making pro process? Yes, so I think this decision probably had its origins um, in two years ago, after March 15th, when uh, there was terrible terror attack on a mosque in Christchurch, and 51 people were killed in the attack. And um, one of the most horrific aspects of it was that the whole thing was live streamed on Facebook to the world. And at that time, 
we decided that as an organisation that, um, you know, was based in New Zealand, had a very strong um, focus on serving our local communities, that we couldn't, we couldn't see um, that it was right to financially support Facebook with our own advertising and therefore enable that kind of, you know, um, uh, behavior to to happen on that platform so we stopped advertising our own content on Facebook in 2019 and that um, that has zero impact on us didn't affect our audience at all in any way um, and so scroll forward a year later till I had bought stuff and um, as part of our examining what we wanted to do we decided that our key metric for success for the company was going to be um, a measurable increase in public trust in stuff and in the journalism we produce. And that led us to examine what kind of relationship did we want to have with Facebook, which we did not always see as a platform that prioritised trustworthy content or prioritised um, truthful content. And at that time, there was also, you know, all the... Um, the, the sort of fake news around COVID swirling around. There was a lot of activity around Black Lives Matters and a lot of fake information and sort of hate speech swirling there. So we decided that we would take a pause for initially what we thought might be four or five weeks um, from any activity on Facebook or its other platforms at all. Um, mostly at that time, we wanted to just gather data for ourselves over the course of a month or so to see what would happen if we stopped posting on Facebook. Um, but the news that we had done that quickly um, spread. Um, other news organisations wrote about it and published it and it became a news story here. And what we saw um, as a result of that was um, what we thought would be a quiet experiment turned into something that um, became quite a big deal in the market here we saw a huge increase in the number of um, public um, donations and subscriptions to our products. We had loads of hundreds of emails, um, letters, comments um, from the public saying how much they supported us in doing it. And we had very strong support from advertisers as well who themselves had been grappling with their own um, relationship with Facebook and, and the other platforms and, um, uh, you know, in the post, the, the, the year after the attack on the mosque here. And um, uh, so, what, um, Shinnit, yeah. what, what effects did this have on your traffic? So when, you, when you're talking about the effect on, on advertisers and um, on, um, on uh, public donations, what happened to yeah. your traffic? That is the most fear maybe some publishers have. Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons we kept going with the experiment was it was initially we found it very hard to tell exactly what the impact was on our traffic because it was such an exceptional news year. You know, there was all the news around COVID. Um, we ourselves had an election. Um, you know, so there was a lot of unusual news activity that was spiking traffic and, um, and making it difficult to sort of really read the underlying patterns. But having looked back now, what we found is that in the last year, um, almost a year since we paused Facebook, our traffic has grown. Um, our direct traffic has grown significantly. And um, and we are we are sort of have been very happy with that decision and the impact therefore that it's, it's had on us. But what we probably think is that if we had stayed in Facebook, um, our audience may be another three or four or five percent higher. It was really difficult to, to tell. Um, but overall, we've still experienced quite strong growth in the last year. Great. So, but do you think that it will be maybe dangerous to leave these platforms that will help you reaching out to audiences that you would normally not reach with your content because they're on other places on the internet? So did you think about that? Yes, we definitely thought about that. And I think we still think about that. And even though we've been doing this for almost a year, we are very careful to talk about it as an ongoing experiment rather than a permanent state of affairs. Because one of the things we really want to try and assess is 
Um, we're very comfortable with the impact on our, um, you know, it's had no commercial impact on us in terms of advertising or loss of revenue. It just has a positive impact on us in terms of public sentiment. And now we're trying to gauge whether there is a risk that our journalism is not going to have the impact that we want it to do by not reaching the people who um, we would like to read it, but who are not necessarily coming to, to staff. And um, I think we look at that not just from the point of view of growing our audience, but because our audit, we're already the biggest digital brand, the big, biggest digital site in New Zealand, not just the biggest media site, we're the biggest site full stop with only Facebook and Google bigger than us. So we're looking at it through the lens of other groups, say particularly groups around um, uh, you know, we're, New Zealand is only at the very beginning of starting to roll out COVID vaccination. And a lot of the groups who may be hesitant about getting a vaccination or are more prone to believe conspiracy theories about vaccinations and COVID are, um, are sucking up that content from Facebook. And so we're trying to think about the impact of our journalism, good quality journalism not being on Facebook. Does that mean there are people who are more likely to just read the, um, you know, the, the misinformation when we so could be is, doing a better job putting that in front of them. What is very interesting about your um, model as well is that you implemented a reader contribution model like the Guardians, may some of our audience may no notice that. So why did you decide to do it this way and not to have a reg regular subscription model? I think, again, initially that was because while we were being um, a business that was being held up for sale by our previous owner, um, we couldn't invest in anything. You know, we couldn't put invest in any um, uh, digital subscription technology or models. They didn't want us to do anything. So when we took ownership of the company, um, we were able to put up that sort of donations model, which was during the COVID lock, the first COVID lockdown here in New Zealand, as a way of um, of, of bringing in um, you know financial support from readers without putting a paywall up in front of important journalism during the um, during the pandemic. And what we found from that was that, that uh, you know. People were very happy to sign up to regular monthly contributions, and it's become, in its way, its own form of a digital, a voluntary digital subscription. Because most of the people who have signed up to do that have signed up to do it as a recurring payment. Um, I think in future that we will be, you know, at some point implementing different forms of paid digital subscriptions. But at the moment, we've been very happy with that, and. We saw um, things that we did, like the Facebook um, change, um, another big project that we did here, which was an examination of our historic reporting for our Indigenous people, mm -hmm. the Maori people here, and, and an apology from us um, around some of the racist reporting that we had done in the past. Things like that have seen, you know, the um, donations come in from the public really surge ahead they respond very well to things that are about trust and, and resetting relationships. That's great to hear. So one last question before we um, have to say goodbye to Auckland. How does Facebook have to change this so that you would actively use Facebook again with your company? Is there anything yeah. they could do? Yes, absolutely. And I think we have had talks with Facebook in the last, you know, a couple of months. Um, the good thing about being outside of Facebook is that we've realized the um, the sky doesn't fall on top of us by withdrawing ourselves from Facebook, but it puts us in a stronger position um, to be very confident talking about to Facebook and, and to others about what we stand for and what would be important for us in engaging. And I think what we'd like to see from Facebook is um, some stronger moves um, that have more definite outcomes around reducing fake news, misinformation, and hate speech. And um, I think what what may also change things here is our own government is looking at introducing a new regulation around content on social media platforms that would probably alter the kind of content that people would sit would see here um, in a in a positive way. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing that would change is if we ourselves had a sense that our journalism was starting to have um, 
less impact in reaching the groups of people that we wanted it to reach, um, we would reassess that relationship then. Thank you so much for sharing your insights f with us tonight in your time. So thank you and uh, a good night to Wellington. Thank you, Shinnett Bauch. Uh, good night and danke schon. Vielen Dank. <laughs> thank you.